Hey, welcome back. This is part three of the assessment of sea trout in Louisiana waters, the 2019 report. And first of all, before we get into this, uh, you know, I just wanted to say that uh, I've been uh, pleased with all of the comments that you guys have been putting in. A lot of uh, concerned people, people who have seen the history, uh, they do believe that the, the speckled trout uh, stock is declining and there are some issues and people have been making comments, um, some guidance, uh, a lot of really interesting stuff. So uh, I do, do appreciate and, uh, uh, and enjoy reading all those comments. You know, and just to give you a little insight into my own perspective on this, uh, when an article came out in the July 2019 Louisiana Sportsman Magazine, and it was an article about the sea trout situation. It's called Speckled Trout in Trouble, and it was the so-called leaked data from wildlife uh, and fisheries, Louisiana Wildlife and Fisheries, and it was the first look where we had heard some rumors before about some data that said didn't look very favorable, but this is the first time I had seen that data. And, you know, I got to be honest, I had a crisis of faith when I saw that data. And the reason that I call it a crisis of faith is that I had faith that the 25 trout per day per fisherman creel limit was adequately high or low, however you want to look at it, to keep the stock strong, robust, that there, if, as long as we didn't catch more than 25, everything was going to be okay. So when I saw the data in this report, I'll tell you, as a fishing content creator for social media, that really kind of took the wind out of my sails. And, uh, uh, and you know, I, I didn't make a, any content for a little while. I kind, of, I kind of got off track because of that. I just, again, I had a crisis of faith about what we were doing. And, uh, you know, just to talk a little bit about the history of limits. So I found this article from 1923. It was actually 1928. It was a, a digest of the new Fish Bill Act 264 passed by the legislature of 1928. And this is for Louisiana. This was passed in New Orleans. And I know this is a little hard to read for you, but... Um, the speckled trout or sea trout had a size limit of 12 inches or more, but 25 undersized, undersized specimens of speckled trout, redfish, sheep's head, or flounders in the aggregate are permitted in one day for home consumption, but not for sale. So basically, you could keep 25 speckled trout of any size. It didn't matter. You could keep... 25, 6 inches if you wanted. And then if it was over 12 inch, you could keep an infinite number of speckled trout. Just let that sink in a little bit. And of course, we know the stock is nothing like it was back then when you would fill coolers full of trout, or so I heard I wasn't alive back then, nor in Louisiana. But uh, as far as the modern era goes, there's a nice fact sheet uh, on the LSU Ag Center. I guess it's the Louisiana Fisheries uh, site. It's, it's, a, it's a little article written by Gerald Horst, and I'll link to this article. If you look down here, he talks about the history, and I'm just going to point out uh, that the recreational limit was, re was reduced to 25. It's the creole limit of 25 per day per person in 1988. So if we go to the trout assessment report, and actually this is, these are charts I've just pulled off of it, so I'm not actually looking at it, but this is the charts. Uh, you can see that the recreational landings were basically 
uh, eliminated in around 1997. It's really insignificant since 1997. Uh, but the thing that we, I want to look at is to compare these two charts. This is recreational landings by year, so each dot is a year, compared to the spawning stock biomass, that SSB number that we've been talking about a lot. And let, let's just see how these two correlate. So you see that way back in you know, this is like, what, 99, maybe 1982 or something like that. We can see that the, the SSB was quite high. It looks like it's about at least 9, maybe 9.5 million pounds. But the landings were, it weren't even 4 million. So it was less than half of what the SSB is. So that looks very healthy from my estimation. And then you can see that the SSB started coming down, and so did the landings. So they came down. Um, this is when that 25 fish per day per fisherman creole limit came in, right around uh, this 1987, 1988, so right in this time period. Uh, you can see that the landings were kind of stable during this. This is recreational landings. were stable during this period. Uh, still dropped down, but and and the landings dropped down as well. But look how long it took for the SSB to recover from the lowest level it had been that they've recorded. It took at least five years before it started coming up significantly. And then the landings followed that up. You can see that up here uh, to, to a pretty high point around year 2000. And then there was another dip in the SSB and a dip in the landings. And then the landings went back up to really high levels, you know, almost 8 million pounds, maybe 7.5 million pounds. And the SSB was going up though too. And it went up to over eight, maybe close to nine. So again, 9,000 pounds SSB landings up maybe seven and a half million. So you can see that difference. The SSB is still on greater than the landings, just like we saw back at the start of this study, back in the early 1980s. So now, we get into the more modern era, and this is when things start to look strange. Up until this point, there's been a good correlation between SSB and the landings. But there's a big drop uh, in, this would be 2011, 12. So in 2013, there's this big drop. And we also see a drop in the SSB. It's going down. And we get down here, uh, SSB is around uh, four and a half million, and the landings are down uh, about three, a little over three million pounds. So again, there's that good rate, there's, there's a differential, um, a positive differential of SSB over the landings. But, it stopped, these two charts stop correlating after 2013. So this is 2013, 2013, actually it's 2014. So in 2014, landings go up significantly to, oh, to almost 6 million pounds. And this would be 2015, 16, 2017. But the SSB continues to go down and in in uh, 2018 it pretty much crashes out down to about three and a half million pounds and the landings also crash in 2018 down to less than three million pounds so what happened in that time period from 2014 up until the modern time right now, why did those not correlate anymore? 
So, okay, what was going on? What, what do we know that was going on during that time? The one thing is that the Louisiana Creole survey that they do at the, at the, the marinas and they do some mail and, and call in, I guess, as well, that started in 2014. So they started getting a lot more data, maybe more accurate data than they were getting with the MRIP survey, but they were getting an extra set of data. Uh, but the other big thing that was going on uh, that really took off during that time was the fishing community driven by social media. And it actually started, you know, a few years before that, but really it's 2011, 2012 is when Facebook really started exploding. And there was a lot of good uh, traction gained by the fishing community through social media. And there was a lot of effort uh, driven by some of the key players to, to make this community a beneficial place, a place where people could learn, uh, a community that would be supportive and people would get to know each other. And that's, you know, that's kind of what social media is supposed to do. And, you know, I, for, I, I really am quite a fan of that. Uh, and I think it's a lot better than the old system where you got a bunch of crotchety old fishermen and I'm not going to tell you anything. I'm not going to tell you where I fish and I don't want you fishing in my spots and I don't want you to know what I, how I fish. Uh, you know, it's just this big competition about, you know, who's on top or, or whatever. I mean, <laughs> there's probably some biological uh, uh, reasons for, for people acting like that, especially men. But uh, nonetheless, I would say that the social media community or, or the community driven and, and really birthed by social, social media was much different than that. And there was a lot more positive vibes going on and people being very helpful and that kind of thing. Uh, but it also, I really believe it made fishermen more successful, fishermen who were part of that community. For one thing, it was easy to pass around the reports and uh, let other people know where you fished and how you fished and all of that. Uh, could that be one reason that we saw that incredible increase in, this, in the landings? during the 2014 to 2017 era, those do seem to be caused, could be cause and effect. Like a lot of people, you know, I really believe that our habitat at two and a half million acres of wetland, of marshland, was more than adequate to uh, accommodate the increased success of fishermen and that the stock was robust and there were uh, so many speckled trout that you know recreational anglers are not going to impact it negatively it just can't happen however when you see data like this you realize that the landings and the SSB, the modeled SSB amounts, they align, you know, surprisingly well. So, uh, you know, in 2017, the landings were like five and a half million pounds, and the SSB stock for that was less than five million pounds. So it's not like the SSB is 20 or 30 million and the recreational landings are like 5 million. It's not that kind of magnitude. They're surprisingly close. And, and, and to, to find uh, a greater disparity, you have to go way back to the start of this in the early 80s when, when the, the SSB was twice as big as the landings. Now, of course, we know that in 2019 the fishermen are not only successful due to uh, social media but they have a lot more powerful boats than they did in 1982 
they have eye pilots and imaging sonar and uh, they have navigation ships um, they've got power poles they've got good nice rods um, advanced reels there's so many bait choices all of these things will contribute to the success of the of the fishermen and, and push up the landings um, of course the landings can't keep going up if the bio if the SSB starts coming down so you're gonna see a crash and I think that's what we saw in 2018 we saw a crash in the landings and you know when the report came out in Louisiana Sportsman magazine I realized that I had been making a lot of excuses why I hadn't been seeing as many trout the last few years but they were a diversion from what was going on I was saying things like, well, you know, there was a Bonacary uh, spillway has been open and uh, the, all that river water and, and high Mississippi River uh, has messed up things uh, or there's too much grass or, uh, you know, blue-green algae or uh, the winters were too cold, summers were too hot. You know, these were... Or, or maybe the fish, well, the fish over on the west side of the river, it's better fishing over there than this year. Um, the east side's better, uh, so the fish just aren't as good wherever I'm fishing. But these are all excuses that were going through my head because I hadn't seen this data. And so I just was not questioning my faith in the robustness and magnitude of the spawning stock biomass in Louisiana. And all that kind of crashed down in July when for the first time I saw this data. Now of course uh, the data in this in this uh, um, edition of the magazine was the preliminary data so it wasn't final and they've updated since then and of course I've we've been going through the actual report from Louisiana Wildlife and Fisheries the assessment report which gives the final data that's been looked at uh, not just by Louisiana but also by uh, neighboring states by the wildlife and fishery researchers over there and so they're pretty comfortable about the accuracy of this data or, or you know as as good as it can be okay had to step away for a second there but I need to wrap up this part three video you know I, I had said in part two I would get to a lot of things uh, in part three but I only got to a portion of what I intended to get to there's really a lot of things to talk about in this report and this this subject it doesn't just go away this is not something you can cover in a short discussion. But I want to leave it on a positive note. And so the one positive thing that in the Wildlife and Fisheries Report uh, and that they acknowledge is that the recruits, these are the age one recruits, are those that are coming up, the trout that are coming up and replacing the uh, spawning stock. So those numbers look pretty good, and if, if you look on these two charts, again, the, this bottom one is the H1 recruits, and then you got the SSB at the top. So again, I want to look at the two, the comparisons here, uh, look for correlations between these two uh, categories of trout. So you'll see that when the SSB was dropping in, in the 80s, got down really low down to route 1990 there was a drop also in recruitment initially but it went back up uh, probably helped here by the change to 25 trout per day per angler and also um, a reduction there was also a change during that time in what they allowed for the commercial fishing so Wildlife and Fisheries is pointing out that there that this recruiting stock has been pretty strong and we can see a correlated drop in the early 2000s between both groups of fish but the recruitment has been pretty good it dropped down again in 
you know, to 2011, 13, 14, but it came back up. And if you look at the mean here, it's not that much different than it has been over the last 20 years. So, uh, and, and, and most importantly, we didn't see a correlated drop in the recruits in the last four years like we've seen in the SSB. So those are the reasons that wildlife and fisheries are positive and they have a positive outlook about the ability of the SSB to, re to rebound at the, if some changes are made in how the stock is managed. And so that is, of course, wildlife and fisheries job. And uh, I want to understand what the job that they need to do in the data. And that's why I'm making these videos. And I hope you're getting something out of them too. So I'm going to make a part four. And, uh, you know, I want to talk more about, a little more about some of the data. Uh, I'd also like to talk about how do we understand um, the differentials in age and amount of eggs that are produced? How can we wrap our head around? Uh, does it matter if you have more uh, one-year-olds, two-year-olds? Is, is the four or five-year-old the important fish when it comes to spawning stock uh, or egg production? And so I want to talk a little bit more of that, uh, just throw around some uh, sort of mathematical relationships and see what comes out when we look at the egg production versus age. So stick around for part four, and I hope you're getting as much out of this as I am.